Okay, hi, this is the last modules for the cardiovascular system. We will talk about the vascular disorders, and here basically we're talking about the peripheral um, uh, vascular problems. Uh, we will talk mainly about the peripheral arteries and the peripheral uh, veins. And now, regardless of the disease, the process is the same. So, we will basically focus on the pathophysiology, and that will uh, clarify the clinical manifestations and then. Um, it's extremely important to know the nursing management for the different disorders and the differences in terms of the presentations of arterial versus venous and of course the differences in the management. These are the two major uh, things of, out of these modules. So we'll start with the peripheral um, artery. Again, there are two types. We have the arterial and we have the venous. And we're going to start with the peripheral arterial disease. Now. Uh, we will focus on the uh, lower extremities basically because that's the most common cases that you would see. Uh, it is rarely to see um, the uh, peripheral vascular or arterial problem in the upper extremities, but if you do, uh, the management and the manifestation will continue to be the same. So as we said before, we don't focus on medical conditions as much as more of understanding of it and see how that's applicable for your critical thinking, clinical judgment, and clinical reasoning. So, uh, as we talked before in the coronary artery disease, it's the same process. There's some injury to the a wall of the artery that can uh, cause inflammation in the endothelial, or maybe there's accumulation of cholesterol and so on. So, pretty much the pathophysiology is the same, leading that the, the wall of the artery become thick and the significance of that is that the blood flow will be not will not be normal and lack in the blood flow means uh, ischemia eventually could be more serious than ischemia could get lead to necrosis so again this is all about having a normal blood flow with, where the blood can carry oxygen and nutrients to the cells and obstruction whether partial or complete obstruction can be serious now, the uh, risk factors that you would see uh, in patient with a, with a PAD, uh, mainly you see it uh, with advanced age, and that's, we talked about that, how age can uh, basically just uh, aging, as part of aging the process where they, the blood vessels, they lose their elasticity and also the uh, intima uh, injury and so on. Diabetes, the high, oh, again, we talk about uncontrolled diabetes where the high glucose level can be very irritating to the intima to the endothelium endothelial level of the arteries and that can cause that's a problem it's observed to be high highest uh, among hispanic uh, american women hypertension is another risk factor again with a continuous high pressure, blood pressure that's not controlled the endothelium can um, be damaged because of this continuous blood pressure tobacco use the nicotine has a vasoconstriction effect on the blood vessels and it eventually cause them to become hard and lose their elasticity and hyperlipidemia as it's imposed the high cholesterol so you need to do risk factors for two things first you when um, you the assessment uh, for the history of your patient you may find one of these risk factors also you need for education whether preventive or after the patient uh, got the disease on how they need to cut down for example uh, quit smoking or treating their hyperlipidemia. Simply the pathophysiology, there's other sclerosis or thrombosis that leads to partial or complete, complete occlusion and then that's where we get what we call the five P's to be the, the, sim the symptoms. So pulselessness when you don't feel pulse, paralysis as a result of lack of blood flow, paresthesia which is the numbness or tingling sensation, pain and that's ischemic pain that it, that results from the lactic acid accumulation. We talked about how that uh, is caused by uh, the uh, cells switching to anaerobic metabolism and the pillar uh, when the color change as a result of lack of perfusion. So we will again focus on lower extremities, PAD, and the most commonly you see it either in the femoral arteries, um, uh, tibial or peroneal, which is also the fibular artery or again in anterior or posterior tibia. The most common thing that you'll see in the hospital, especially with surgery, is there is um, usually in the femoral here. So again, remember wherever there's a problem or a clot, there's no perfusion below that point, and that's where the pulse, and that's where you would see the symptoms. 
okay? Again, it's very important to remember also that, the, you know, the function of the artery because you need to differentiate between the symptoms of PAD and PVD later. But the function of the arterial, uh, of the artery is carry arterial blood where there's pressure, where there's pulse, where there's uh, uh, warm blood that brings the, uh, and cause the temperature scan, uh, where is the, uh, the skin healing and growth of hair and growth of the actual cell uh, skin, sorry, uh, depends on this arterial blood. So whenever this blood is cut off, then you would see manifestation as, again, ischemia, uh, because of switching to anaerobic, you would see that the skin become atrophic, the ulcers takes longer to heal, the hair loss, and mainly, of course, uh, the temperature, the extremity will be cold, um, and again, you don't feel pulse. So, let's see what you've, again, in the history, what you'll find is whatever is, is probably is causing the PAD for this patient. We talked about these risk factors. And then the other symptoms that one of the most classical symptoms and the most common thing that you will see in the hospital and in exams, it's what we call intermittent claudication. Intermittent from its name, that's it's on and off. And whenever you see, I see intermittent claudication, it's always mean arterial. The pain, this is the classical description of this pain. It's pain, it's cramping, and there's some weakness in the calf muscles. And it's mainly after exercise, so whenever the patient stops and rests, usually they feel better. But again, remember that this ischemic pain is used due to lactic acid accumulation. So keep in mind, if anybody is complaining with intermittent claudication, the management will be to rest because there is a demand of oxygen that's not that the blood circulation is not able to meet. Just as we had in ischemia and coronary, coronary artery disease, high demand of oxygen, there's here also high demand of oxygen as a result of exercise. So to decrease that demand of oxygen, just rest. This is not a time where you wanna elevate the, the leg of the patients because if you elevate it, you make it harder for the circulation to go up because of the extremities, okay? Sorry, because of the gravity. So always this patient has to have their you know rest, maybe dangling their, their legs to make the leg in, in, in dependent position and enhance the circulation using the gravity. Okay, and another thing is, Barathena, whenever you have a patient complain of numbness and tingling, um, it could be either neuro, where there's a compression in the um, of the nerve, or it has to do with a decrease of perfusion, depends on the patient's history. So if the case is about a patient with PAD or a patient with cardiovascular problems, then um, and the patient complained of nungling right away you want to test the pulse this was an, a question a question last time about patient post cardiac catheterization when we use the femoral um, artery and the patient was complaining of of tingling and numbness right away you needed to check the pulse because that's an indication of lack of pulse when you do a physical examination one of the exams is a uh, paler which when you elevate the leg of the patient with PAD, then the color you can notice that the color will change to more of pale. You don't feel pulse, okay? Now, <clears throat> some of the pulses are hard to feel, so you need to be a critical thinker. If you feel the, that if the patient doesn't complain of pain and the both extremities have the same temperature and color, but you don't feel the pulse, that probably means that the pulse is weak because there's no way that the patient will not complain of pain and have normal color and normal temperature and there's no perfusion. So you may need to use a Doppler for weak pulses where you have to amplify the pulse so you can hear it. Uh, for a patient with the prolonged PAD, you will see that there's, there's their, um, due to the lack of uh, perfusion, that their skin become uh, thin and shiny and that there will be hair loss in that specific uh, label. Now, an indication of poor prognosis where you may have to report if the patient's within your, in your, under your care. If the patients start to have pain while they're resting, remember unstable angina and stable angina here again. If the patient used to have pain because they're exercised as a result of an increase in demand of oxygen, you know, that's that's bad, but it's, it's become worse if the pain comes even at rest. Because if the patient has pain at rest, that means that there is a, re a serious occlusion. And so even with no increased demand of demand of oxygen, there's a problem. So, and that's usually happen at night when the patient laying in their bed, and that's when the cardiac output become hard, uh, dropped. 
because of the position. So you need to report that. Again, if the patient has ulcer, usually it takes longer to heal. Now, the, it may come and not become like necrotic and gangrenes. You have this is also an indication of poor prognosis, indication that the management is not effective, delaying of healing for wounds and ulcers, and eventually the patient we may have to um, do an amputation. So this is uh, uh, where is the the classical place where the intermittent claudication is caused, and here's a gangrene due to a. a ineffective management of PAD or patients not you know modifying their lifestyle and um, controlling their uh, blood pressure and blood sugar and this is the uh, paler color that you get when you have the patient in and you can see the ulcers here all this because of PAD and PAD could be again it's not necessarily cardiovascular it could be related to a diabetic so that's why we call them diabetic ulcers sometimes so how we diagnose that again you have you do the physical examination and that's what you look for the five P's or and then uh, to do it more of objective we do a Doppler ultrasonography we also could do segmental blood pressure so as you know the blood pressure ideally the blood pressure in the in any of the artery so whether you use the radial the brachial the femoral and it's not possible because the position or both lethal, the blood pressure should be close enough to each now Whenever the blood vessels become hard, the blood pressure in that uh, in that area will be higher than normal. Again, because remember the blood pressure. Well, I'm talking about non-invasive blood pressure, of course. Here, when you apply that cough and you increase the uh, pressure, what the function, the way that sphygmomanometer works, is by occluding the blood vessels. It measures the amount of a pressure that is required to occlude the blood vessels and that's when the pulse disappears right so let's say the blood pressure is 120 if you measure it in the brachial and it's 120 and if the patient has a, a PAD problem let's say their their um, popliteal artery is um, occluded or it's um, hard now became hard when you measure the blood pressure in that area you will find it higher than the brachial which doesn't make sense um, so in, um, if, if that's one of the indication uh, that there's a PAD <clears throat> okay the other thing the segmental blood pressure we take it at the uh, thigh level you take it at the knee level and the ankle the blood pressure normally should vary it and should go should decrease because as you go further from the heart blood pressure may drop a little bit but if the patient has PAD you get the opposite again not because the blood pressure is really high it's because the heart Blood vessels make it hard, harder for the, the blood pressure cuff to occlude the blood vessels, and that's why you get a false high blood pressure. And so that's what we call the ankle brachial index. You take the blood pressure at the brachial divided it by the uh, at the ankle. We'll talk about the numbers. We do a CBC and, and basic metabolic uh, panel. Uh, to see and then we do a D dimer. Now the Doppler ultrasonography, this is the best test to identify if there is a blood clot or <clears throat> if the uh, the arteries are, are um, hard the wall became hard or not now let me talk about one button let's start with Doppler ultrasonography first of all this is remember this is non-invasive so basically this is the machine and this is the Doppler and so we put gel and there's no kind of no, no preparation for this patient uh, wherever we're suspecting there's a clot or a, a PAD uh, the tick machine this takes about 20 to 30 minutes the patient can lie in bed and um, this through using the Doppler just as we did with the echocardiogram but this is for the peripheral arteries and on the screen you can see the blood perfusion uh, it's color coded uh, whether it's venous or arterial and if there's any occlusion you could measure so again this it's ultrasound so there's no x-ray so a pregnant woman they don't have to on a patient who's uh, you know afraid of x-ray don't have to worry about it and again it's just visualize the blood flow within the blood vessels okay uh, through it you can see again if there's blood flow you can see if you push down on or try to occlude the artery you can see if you can include it using the ultrasound or if not then that means that the wall is hard and if there is a blood clot you could see it also in the ultrasound so this is the best test again to identify the place of the clots remember with D-dimer 
If the dimer is positive, <clears throat> it means that there is a clot somewhere, but you won't be able to know where exactly unless you do a more, um, uh, more of radiology uh, images. So you can see here, this is a blood clot. For example, this is a report of ultrasonography, uh, uh, you know, a Doppler. Okay. The ankle brachial, again, you take the blood pressure. Normally, the difference between the ankle and the brachial is 0 0.9 to 1.3. Um, as this number goes down, it indicates that the lower extremities, blood vessels, are, are, or arteries mainly here, become hard. Okay. Now, this can be done at rest, but usually it's done in, while the patient is on treadmill to see if uh, there's any difference. Okay. So again, here you take the blood pressure and you divide them. So for example, for this patient in the right arm, it was 120. And in the left, uh, sorry, in the in the right leg, it was um, it was one sixty eight in the posterior tibial, and by in the third cell space, it was sixty four. So you can go with either number. And in the left arm, we find it to be a hundred, and down we find it to be one hundred thirty six and one hundred thirty two. So you go with the highest number, as you see, and then you divide. <clears throat> so here we divided sixty eight uh, by one twenty and give us the number of fifty six, which fifty seven, which is extremely low because and this indicates moderate to severe occlusion and when we did the the right, left area um, it was 100 over 136 and that 136 over 100 and that was um, 113 1.13 1. so this was within normal and then so this indicates that the right uh, lower extremities uh, uh, arteries they there is a PAD in the in that area while the left is fine Okay, for the management of PAD, as always, we start with the preventive, unless the patient has some serious symptoms. Uh, the preventive measures here, you're going to just ask the patient to modify their risk factors. So if they smoke, they need to quit smoking, they need to control their diabetes, they need to control their blood pressure, exercise and rest and um, balance, sedentary lifestyle to change, to add exercise and so on. Now, the patients come with intermittent claudication, we have medication to treat that symptoms. Uh, and that's usually when the, when the rest is not enough. And if there's a clot, we can use a TPA as we did before. Proper foot care is important. Now, catheterization procedure, as we did with coronary arteries, we have the options here. Through a catheter, we can use the balloon as we did before. We could do it, do it with or without stint. And you remember what we did with the balloon, insert the catheter and inflate and deflate the balloon several times around the area that's occluded with uh, atherosclerosis or cholesterol. Also, through the, the same procedure, we can do atherectomy, which means we can remove some part or all of the, um, ather of the uh, black in that area that's closing. <clears throat> and there's a new um, procedure where we do the balloon as well as uh, a cryoplasty. They call it cryoplasty. Again, cryo means that we, we use um, cold th uh, therapy. So we apply a low, very low temperature to this black and froze them and make them stable so they don't move and they cause uh, other problems. And if that, if none of this works, then we have surgical procedure. Uh, one of them is uh, uh, the peripheral artery bypass, and I'll show you a picture on it. Uh, we all could do also with a graft. And all we could do, which rarely we do, we can open the legs and trying to reach the blood, affected the blood vessels and remove the um, blood clots use, uh, through that surgery. And if all that fails and now the patient has necrosis, then we have to do am amputation. Now, again, here's a cardiovascular risk modification uh, that we talked about. Uh, these are, uh, you know, general where the patient need to control their chronic problems and, you know, with exercise and smoking cessation. And then we have a prophylactic. We can use antiplatelets. We can use aspirin, most commonly used. Depends on the patient's weight and condition. It can vary from 81 to 325 milligrams every day, of course, PO. Or we can use Plavix. Okay, now both of them, again, you know aspirin has multiple effects, but now we only use aspirin for the platelet aggregation. They decrease or prevent platelet aggregation. This way, you decrease the chance of thrombosis. Because what thrombosis is, it takes blood factor, clotting factors and platelets and, so, and white blood cells and so on. So different medication focus on different component of, thrombos, of, the, of a thrombi and this way we decrease the risk for thrombosis. Now a few things, this was probably covered in farm, but a few things that I would like to highlight as far as Plavix. Again, 
This is antiplatelet, a medication given at 75 mg BO daily. And again, the function is to suppress the platelet aggregation. This can be taken with or without food. But now, always remember any patient that takes medication that decreases the thrombosis or decreases the coagulation in general, um, they increase the risk for bleeding. So if this patient has elective surgery, we should stop it five days before. We talked about warfarin two days before and so on. Now, there's something important here that you need to know. It can be in the board. Plavix and omeprazole, okay, which is a, a plump up inhibitor. Uh, it's very important to the interaction between them that the antiplatelet of a plavix is reduced by 50% if it's combined with omeprazole. So if the patient has to, now sometimes we just change the medication, but if they are taken together, uh, the plavix, uh, it goes down to 50%. So that's why if the patient must take plavix, and there's some patient must, if, especially if we put a stent for the patient, plavix is a must. Um, and so if we have, if, if the patient must take it to Amprazol, we may double the dose because it reduced by 50% due to their interaction. Okay, so the effectiveness of plavix is reduced. Now you'll find that Amprazol, when it interacts with another medication, it does the opposite. So remember, plavix, and let the X remind you, plavix means, plavix with Amprazol, with the X, remember that there's some effects that's canceled. So 50% of plavix is lost when it's combined with Amprazole. The other medication that we use, and the most common one is the Pletal for intermittent claudication. What this does, there's two, actually two things. It's a platelet aggregation. Also, it decreases the viscosity of the um, blood. It makes the uh, RBCs a little flexible, so the perfusion is enhanced. Now, it's stronger than aspirin, and that's why it is the drug of choice for intermittent claudication. Uh, it's important to remind your patient that it may take 12 weeks for it to for them to start to feel like a full effect. So just like any medication, wait, wait, and don't give up on a medication after one or two weeks because it may take longer. Now, platelet uh, when it's combined with Emprazole, it does the opposite. Actually, it's become it increases the level almost by double. So that's why we have to reduce. The platelet, the platelet is usually given 100 milligrams. If it's combined with Emprazole, we go down to 50 milligrams. So again, a platelet with Emprazole, a uh, platelet becomes high, the level. Plavix with Emprazole, Plavix is reduced. And then if the patient comes with acute ischemia, where it's not relieved by, by rest, and we can identify the blood clots and the ultrasonography in the artery, we may consider using some TPA um, just directly to that site but only it must be ischemic when the patient again is completely blocked here's all the procedure that we use again this is the first one this is an artery and you can see the black so we put the uh, catheter first and then we inflate the balloon and deflate several times and this is the outcome and sometimes we may put a stint okay to keep it open especially if there's vasospasm the uh, atherectomy here's the same thing but the catheter now it has a special device where we can cut part of the um, and then get suction there's a suction so we can cut part of the thrombi uh, sorry of the black and here's the third one which is the uh, cryo so again here's a black completely almost completely blocking it we put the catheter inflate the balloon and then at the same time we also frozen it by applying uh, cold temperature and that's gonna make it like again frozen just one piece and this way stabilize it from its place and then the surgical procedure again here's a patient with a complete obstruction between the femoral arteries and the popliteal arteries and this is the most common that you will see so what we do in the surg uh, during surgery we do a bypass graft so this is from a saphenous vein or any extra vein in the, in, the, in the patients that we can use. And we make a cut here, get anastomosis here and so on. And now the blood flow goes through the graft and we bypass this area. So we can suture it here and suture it here. And now the blood flow, instead of going this way, now it's going through the graft and that's what we call bypass. This is again a common procedure to see in the hospital. And the post-op is extremely important, the post-op care for this patient. So the post op care, first of all, you need to check the vital signs in, in, in general, but the, the pulse in the affected extremities, and always when there's a problem in one leg, you, when you assess, you compare both legs. 
and then after a thing you know the first we're gonna start for 15 minutes for about one hour and then after that you can look uh, assess every hour you're gonna look at the color the temperature capillary refill and if you know if there's pulse and again the sensation movement for this patient it's very important if you don't feel the pulse and if the patient complains of pain you don't if any of these are abnormal it's an it's a medical emergency you have to uh, notify the physician right away so let's say a patient has a right female popliteal leg they call it and now you can feel the leg left uh, the left leg is warm the right is cold the patient complains of pain in the right leg whether if right after the surgery or could be a few hours after or the next day at any time these symptoms develop a medical emergency right away and look for the uh, any complications of uh, or post-op again a dramatic increase in pain or any uh, you know loss of pulse these are medical emergency right away this patient should have their legs straight so no flexion no pillows under this leg you can turn the patient and but give the pillow to support the incision so the patient doesn't have to be completely in bed rest because you don't want to do uh, cause pressure ulcer you can turn them as long as the leg is not flexed and the next day or the day the next day of the surgery which we'll call a post-op day or number one the patient can get out of bed and actually it's good for them to exercise okay but again as tolerated no prolonged sitting no crossing legs any of the, any of the posturing or position that can increase the, the uh, risk for um, occlusion of the graft the patient should avoid if there's edema which expected around the wound area um, then basically just elevate the leg of this patient now before when the patient comes before surgery elevation of this leg will cause the pain to be more severe severe again because elevation of the leg when there is an arterial problem you make it harder for the perfusion of the arteries or the arterial blood but after the surgery now that we have a graft especially if it's successful the patient can exercise and you can elevate the leg only if there's edema there are other pro PAD I just want to talk about renoids uh, pheno phenomenon again it goes under the same thing but uh, the problem here is vasospasm it's not necessarily atherosclerosis this should remind you of variant angina where there's probably there's no cholesterol problem but there is uh, unknown for unknown reason the uh, blood vessels in the uh, um, you know fingers or toes they become spastic and of course with that spasm there's cut off of the blood supply and can lead to um, you know uh, uh, the same issues that you see in the PAD now um, the people who are at risk for that it seems in typists and painters so those people who they have to use their hand and they have to you know have handheld vibrating equipment or um, using the mouse and you know, the shape of the art the shape of the uh, hands during that time uh, can can put them at risk also exposure to heavy metals like lead as also another contributing factors now a few things for this patient again basically what you need to teach them is to do things that would enhance the vasos um, dilation and prevent the vasoconstriction or vasospasm for example wearing loose um, um, warm clothes uh, stay away from cold weather stay away from freezer fris uh, they may have to wear gloves um, avoid extreme temperature especially cold temperature now if if the pain starts and let's say they got out and it's cold and now they have the spasm and they feel the pain they just uh, one the first thing they need to immerse their hands in warm water because that will you know enhance vasodilation dilation and that will improve the blood circulation in that area and the pain should subside any also again tobacco use or caffeine any of that that's cause vasoconstriction they need to avoid and medication in some cases if these measures don't work we may have to give them calcium channel blockers you know that calcium channel blockers they um, block the calcium and and induce vasodilation in the peripheral arteries so that's why it's a drug of choice so if you see this disease now you need to know it's a PAD it goes under PAD okay that's as far as PAD now for the vein for the vein veins problem um, again I want to start with this is a very important table that you need to to know and see how you can differentiate between arterial and venous fluid first of all okay let's say peripheral pulse again pulse are, are felt in the artery so if if the problem is arterial you may see a decrease or absence if the arteries are fine venous they don't 
um, there's no there's no present there's no problem with the pulse because again pulse all, 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 always means arterial and but if the patient has edema you may have a difficult time to palpate but it doesn't mean that it's not there the capillary refill again capillary refill mainly had to do with arterial so you will see it it prolonged in the arterial and it does not affect it in venous um, the ankle brachial, this applies again, it's arterial problem, it's not venous, so it's normal. Edema, you won't see it in our in per this is more of venous, okay? And so that's that's the, one of the differences. Okay, hair loss, this has to do with peripheral because it depends on the perfusion and, and the blood, bring, the arterial blood brings the nutrients and the vitamins and everything that's needed for that. And it's usually it's not affecting the venous one. Ulcers, there's a major difference between the ulcers that goes by venous, and, and we talked about that early on when we, we talked about the assessment. So what you will see it in the arterial, usually at the end, uh, the ending of the, or the arterial, small arterial loss, that's why you see it at the top, or the tips of the toes and, and foot, and usually in the lateral, because that area, it's um, where the endings are, the, are the arterial loss are. While in the venous, you see it near uh, the medial malleolus, uh, not lateral. It's the opposite. Usually, it's toward the middle of the body. The margin of the arterial ulcers, usually it's round and smooth, and it looks like it's pushed out or punched out, while it's completely irregular in venous. The drainage, usually the minimum drainage in the arterial, and because most of the blood are actually in the venous, and so that's why you say moderate to orange, and that's why that's explain why there's edema also, because most of the 60% of the blood is actually in the veins. Now, the way it looks, that's also another major difference. It may look as a scar, black scar, or pale pink granulation. And the slot is the, what's differentiated the venous to see it yellow slough or dark. And here's the photo of the, you can see the difference between the arterial and the venous, see this, uh, the shape is irregular, the location, you know, lateral versus medial and so on. Okay, the major uh, problem that I will focus on just to highlight what is the problem with the uh, uh, PVDs is, is the thrombosis, a venous thrombosis. What you would see in a hospital, the first thing is the phlebitis, which is basically just an inflammation of the blood, uh, uh, um, blood vessels, and especially this is, has to do mainly with IV catheter. You see it a lot. Now it's rarely infectious, but it's just an inflammation. And this is usually because of a uh, small uh, thrombi that's caused because of, the, if, especially if you have the IV there for a long time and it's not used and there's no IV running. So what you see is redness, tenderness, and the patient may have pain actually. And that's why we ask you every time when you see your patient to assist their, uh, the site of the IV. The other one is the ven venous thrombosis, which basically there's a thrombi and inflammation. Okay, here just this is just an inflammation ITIS. In venous thromb thrombosis, means there's a thrombi in the vein and it's caused inflammation. And the specific to be specific to the one that causes embolism PE, we call it venous thromboembolism VTE. And we talked about when we talked about pulmonary embolism, we say that this is one of the major cause of PE. Now. Let's look at the pathophysiology. We have this triad of three things where the venous, there's a venous status, basically the blood stays in the, in the venous system and this is as a result of probably dysfunction uh, vein valves. As you know, that the blood, the venous blood goes back to the heart uh, through exercise. When you, when, you, when you walk, your muscles uh, moves and squeeze and there's a valve that prevent the venous to come back down. So as your muscles contract, they squeeze the blood vessels and push the blood up. And then the, the veins, when the muscle relaxes, uh, the veins close and so the blood doesn't go down. Now, if there's a problem within these uh, valves in the vein, then again, the blood will not move up and will stay within the venous and that can cause edema and problems. So you see that in, uh, in active extremities and that's why immobility increased DVT because again with immobility the muscles are not contracting um, enough so the, uh, the blood will stay in the blood in the veins. Okay and if there's any problem with the come one direction again the other problem is the endothelial damage 
and this is because of atherosclerosis or because of smoking or, or high blood pressure that's uncontrolled and uh, the last thing is hyperoglobathy basically when the blood become very thick when there is a high fibrin production and that's where we see the the dimer high or there's imbalance between the coagulation and the uh, clotting factors with all this together you see platelet aggregation and that's why we use antiplatelets to decrease this risk right here clotting factors can be stimulated to produce fibrin when the fibrin is low again and with all that together reacting can lead to a thrombi this thrombi will block of the veins and as a result of that if that affected leg you will see a unilateral that's usually it's only in one leg unilateral leg edema and pain and erythema so this is one of the major difference between arterial and veins a problem what you will see edema you don't see that in arterial and the pain here is more of a dull pain it's not ischemic pain as the one in arterial and instead of uh, in, in an arterial problem, you, see, you feel that the patient is cold because there's no perfusion. What you see actually here is the opposite. You see redness and warmth. So there's a temperature problem. So that's another major difference between veins and arterial. Okay. Okay. Now let's look what we, the patient may have again at um, their age, a AFib, a obesity, orthopedic surgery. After orthopedic surgery, you need to pay, you know, it's a key, especially what we call there's a, the fat embolism that can be caused, you know, parts of the a bone may, might form thrombi. Pregnancy increase the risk, prolonged immobility increase the risk, and any kind of surgery also, previous history of VTE, as well as smoking, uh, hormone replacement therapy can increase it, and as well as sepsis. So this is what you see again. This is a DVT. So if you see this picture, this is definitely not arterial. You see a unilateral inflammation, edema, erythema, and if you feel it, you will feel this warm. Uh, so the pain is dull. Uh, again, the patient may feel the numbness. The skin is warm. It's red, and patient overall may have high temperature. Okay, because of this whole inflammation process, uh, it's tender to touch. And the Hohmann signs, which we don't encourage, uh, will be positive in this case, which basically a pain that's caused as a uh, forced dorsiflexion, as you see in this picture, forced dorsiflexion of the foot will, when you have that leg is elevated, basically that caused pain uh, because of the clot. Now, how we diagnose this? As we did in PAD, we pretty much do the same thing based on the physical assessment. And again, the D-dimer will be high, and patient splitting time and uh, eye and arm, you may have differences here. Again, especially if the patient was using anticoagulant and stopped using it. But D-dimer is high, but again, remember, D-dimer will be high if there's any clot anywhere. In order to know where it is, we have to do uh, uh, the uh, ultrasound. So we have the venous um, compression ultrasound, as we did with the PAD again. Uh, we do we look at the femoral papilla and the, and the tibial veins basically what we're looking to see if the veins will collapse with the application of external pressure that's examine the flexibility now if these veins didn't collapse uh, when you apply pressure that means that suggests there's a thrombi there that's up that's a hold that's preventing the collapse makes sense so if you push down on the veins they should collapse now, if there's a clot there, then the clot will be on the way, so you don't see the collapse. That's one, one thing. And then we do the Doplex ultrasound or the, do, the Doppler ultrasonography, the same thing. And again, we do, a, uh, we do the compression, and also we can visually see the uh, blood flow, and we can see if there's a clot. And then we have other options. We do the invasive venous uh, studies. We don't usually do it because a Doplex is usually enough. But this basically a combination of giving the patient a dye in the IV and do uh, radio radiology. So we can do um, CT after we give a contrast. Uh, we can do a venograph also with contrast. Um, so X-ray through the X-ray you can see where the contrast stops, and that tells you that there is an occlusion right there. Again, usually it, with the symptoms and the history and duplex is enough. Okay, so the management. First of all. For any identify the patient who is at risk and we want to do a prevention. Now, if you have a patient in the hospital, always in and, and they have a high risk for DVT, you definitely you want to do all the things that you can do to prevent DVT. You know that the risk to get a DVT at the hospital is 60 times 
uh, more than the risk to get it in the out, you know, in the community. So any patient with the risk factor that you mentioned before, make sure that you change their position. If, they're, if they cannot move, we have to change their position every two hours. Try to exercise and ambulate as tolerated. Um, this is especially for a patient who's going to have uh, surgeries. Uh, we have the TID hose and the stocking, all this that can um, enhance the venous return. Um, and remember, if your patient had that number, uh, that specific size, and after surgery, you may have to change the size. And then this, this patient, as you notice in the hospital, we may have to just give a preventive anticoagulants. You probably noticed that any patient who is like have these fa risk factors that we give them, uh, prophylactic heparin, uh, sub-Q, 5,000 unit every 8 hours or every 12 hours or uh, fragment 5,000 once a day. So we have to give them anti any of this medication to prevent. Again, that's not for every patient, but patient who are at risk. Now let's say the patient comes and now it, they have a DVT, we confirm it, so we can use a pharmacologic therapy. Um, we, to, 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 this pharmacological therapy right now that we're gonna talk about is mainly, it's not to, um, you know, of course, dissolve the clots, it's to prevent the progression of it so because if there's a clot if you don't make the blood thin then this clot will uh, continue to grow or also to prevent another thrombi or to prevent the thrombi from moving and become an emboli so we have comedin available which is a vitamin k antagonist we have the indirect thrombin inhibitors an example of that is heparin we have the direct thrombin inhibitors or new medication like agrostat and argatropan and we have medication that mainly works on factor XA or 10A inhibitors like Arextra. Now, again, remember that this medication do not dissolve the existing blood clots. We're just trying to prevent further. And in order, if you want to lysis the, the existing blood clots, we have to use the fibronic uh, therapy like TPA. Now, if the patient cannot um, you know, be medically treated whether they are have high risk for bleeding or because um, they're not helping, so we have surgical procedure. One 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 of them is to basically open the vein and remove the clot. And that's why it's really we do it. We already do it. It's called open venous thrombectomy. And then the other one, um, especially for patients who are at high risk because of their genetic problem with their and that caused them bleeding disorders, but they are not able to take comedian or heparin. Then we we have another we have what we call the vena in the inferior vena cava filter. This is the this is a device that we put. Uh, it's connected to the uh, vena cava wall, as you see here. We of course we do it through through a catheter, uh, as we did with the catheters before, us, and we leave it there. So this filter basically will let the blood flow, but if there's any clot, it will catch it, and it won't let it go up to cause an MI or stroke or a PE. Yeah, this is, and again, this is used for patients who cannot receive or cannot take medication to prevent the uh, blood clots, okay? Now, during anticoagulant therapy, if you, again, this patient will be probably receive heparin, IV. Now, this is not gonna be prophylactic this time. So prophylactic, you give heparin, sub-Q, 5,000 every eight hours, or fragment 5,000 every 24 hours. Now you have a patient who with excessive blood clot, of course it will be different. So we have to have them in heparin drip. And if you do a heparin drip, have the PTT, monitor the PTT. Uh, and if you try, if you use comedin, uh, PTINR, have the protamine sulfate as an antidote for heparin, have it available whenever the patient starts to bleed. First, of course, you have to stop heparin and then uh, decide to, if we need to give uh, protamine sulfate or not, vitamin K for comedin and fresh frozen plasma for other anticoagulant, okay? Now, of course, you wanna monitor a major thing, anticoagulant or bleeding. You wanna monitor the INR, PTT, and ACT, all these numbers, depends on the medication that you're using to see at their level. And um, there is a, a, pro a complication of using heparin, it's called heparin-induced thrombocytopenia, or HET, which basically um, low platelets, the platelets start to um, decrease, and uh, so if this happens, uh, we have to quit the heparin 
and we may need to replace the platelets if it's not reversed. So let's say a question could be like if you have a patient who's receiving heparin, which of the following should you report immediately or should you or which of the following findings will make you stop the heparin? And uh, so you may get um, P normal PTT uh, or normal PT, normal INR, and then abnormal uh, platelets. So right away, that's an indication that the, the thrombocytopenia was probably caused by heparin, and then you have to stop that medication. So if you have a DVT patients, when they arrive, before, we can, before you start um, anticoagulants or surgery, patients should be in bed rest and the leg should be elevated. The elevation of the leg to decrease the edema and the bed rest to immobilize the leg because we don't want the DVT to move. Now, after you start anticoagulant therapy, and if the patient is able, exercise and ampulation is good. Now, after the treatment, there's a lot of teaching that you need to make sure that your patient understand. These anticoagulants, some of them, they need to follow exactly the way they're described. Some of them may need to take it for the rest of their life. Some of them may take it for a few weeks. They should take it at the same time every every day. Um, if they start to bleed, I mean, they were anticipated to have some bleeding, but this bleed, if they apply pressure, it's not stopped after 10 minutes. They must report that. Um, again, since they are at risk for bleeding, avoid any trauma or any activities that can increase the risk for bleeding. Stay away. While they're taking comedian or heparin, or they, they should not take any aspirin at the same time because we don't want to increase the uh, risk. Uh, alcohol should be uh, moderated and it's very important uh, if they if they're taking comedin as you know comedin works by inhibiting the vitamin K so if they take comedin and they take uh, they eat we like broccoli or spanish or any of the green um, plants that uh, that is full or, or high in vitamin K they then they this the food will cancel the effect of comedin so and then the risk will continue to be high so they need to avoid if they're taking comedin, they need to avoid uh, foods that's high in vitamin K. Okay, and also avoid taking vitamin K as a supplement. If the patients start to complain of chest pain or, an, uh, or shortness of breath, which all these are signs of PE, uh, again, they have to call 911. You teach them that. Now, if this happens in your in the hospital, again, you need to con contact your physician right away. First, you have to sit your patient up give them oxygen, but this is a medical emergency, you have to call your physician.